Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Orleans, President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the seventh, and I'm sad to say the last of our Leader Speak series here in the United States celebrating the National Committee's 50th anniversary. I want to give a special hello to our friends in PACOM, where this is being streamed live. So I hope you're enjoying, enjoying Hawaii. We will hold an additional Leader Speak program in China, where we will feature Chinese leaders, many of whom are National Committee alumni. For 50 years, we at the National Committee have been educating Americans about China and Chinese about America. From ping pong diplomacy to today, we have sought to strengthen the bilateral relationship by fostering exchanges and informed discussions. Through our Leader Speak series, we've gathered Secretaries of State, Treasury, and Defense, Secretaries of Commerce, and U.S. Trade Representatives, including our chair who's seated right here, Carla Hills, national security advisors, as well as global business leaders. Jan is looking at me and reminding me to say, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Today, I am truly honored to be joined by four commanders of the U.S. Pacific Command, the world's largest military command, with an area of responsibility encompassing about half the Earth's surface and approximately 375,000 U.S. military and civilian personnel. All four commanders have served at critical junctures in, in the Sino-American relationship, from responding to the Taiwan Strait crisis in 1996 to, most recently, managing the Asia rebalancing and growing tensions in the region. In the region. Mm. You have the speaker's bios in the brochure, so I will just give a very brief introduction. By the way, for those joining via live stream, you can participate in the conversation or submit a question via Twitter by using the hashtag leaderspeak or tweeting at us at NCUSCR. Before beginning, I want to thank our sponsors, MasterCard and Xcoal Energy and Resources for funding this program. I also want to thank our tireless staff for all the good work they have done to make programs like this a success. Last but not least, I want to thank all four PACOM commanders for joining us today. I think it is fitting that our last leader speak here in the U.S. We have four people who have devoted their lives to service to our country. Between these four admirals, I was just calculating this, we have almost 160 years of service to this country. You guys are old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take that a couple of ways. Seasoned, seasoned. <laughs> I always think when I look at you four, I think you, you're out of central casting. You all look the part. <laughs> but really, I and the American people cannot thank you enough for your service. If I listed all of your accomplishments, we'd have no time for discussion. So let me go right to questions. Admiral Prior, I should call you Joe. I've known you too long to call you Admiral. Let me begin with some history. You were PACOM commander from 1996 to 99, and then ambassador to China from 1999 to 2001. Taiwan Strait crisis, U.S. bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, China's accession to the WTO, and the crash of a Chinese fighter into an EP-3. What was the relationship like then, and what are the lessons that we should apply today from your experience? And keep it to five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I have to be very careful. We were talking with all the electronics around of not getting into too many anecdotes, which we get careless with from time to time. <laughs> but uh, 
what what I'd like to do is uh, is is talk a little bit about my PACOM time, and then I'll try to kibitz when Denny talks maybe about the EP3 uh, incident, which which I was interested in as well. But uh, the I think the you know from '96 to '99, the if you look at the power or the national power of a nation and the political, economic, and military might, I would say the United States had more leverage at that time than we do now. And it's, uh, it's diminished somewhat. But, um, and if you look at the, also in that time was, in 1997 was the economic crisis in Asia, what I call the bot crisis, because it started in, in Thailand. And that reminds me of one harmless anecdote. Was, with, with, at PACOM, I was riding in the back seat of Stape Roy's car when he was in Indonesia. And I commented, what do you know about this economic stuff, Stape? And he said, I don't know, but it looks like it's going to be pretty important. And, he, and it, <laughs> turns out it turned out it was. So uh, I, what I... I'd like to do is focus a little bit on the 1996 Straits crisis and try to talk about how we approach that from PACOM and, uh, and then the lessons learned that we got out of that. And I'll try to do it in uh, five minutes or so. But um, this occurred on uh, the elections in Taiwan were the 23rd of March when Li Tung Wei was the, it was the first direct election of the president of the Republic of uh, Taiwan at that time. Uh, Li Tung Wei had made a previous visit to Cornell, which uh, arise, arose, uh, arose the uh, Chinese ire about his coming. Uh, the, and also, the Chinese in 1995 had fired missiles and done an amphibious exercise in the vicinity of the Taiwan Straits to which the United States gave no reaction at all. We didn't, we didn't react to it at all. So I think that probably the conclusion that uh, the government of China might have had at that time was uh, we, can, we can muck with this a little bit and it'll be all right. But in 96, prior to the election in early March, uh, China declared that they were gonna fire 12 missiles in the vicinity of Taiwan. Uh, Kaohsiung and, and Taipei in those areas. What happened on our side is we heard about this, and I don't remember the exact day, but they were going to fire between the 8th and the 15th of March with the election on the 23rd. Uh, the, the background in the U.S., Clinton was the president. This was post-Lewinsky uh, time, and uh, Jesse Helms still had the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Bill Perry was Secretary of Defense. John Shalley Cashbilly was the chairman. And uh, so, and Warren Christopher was Secretary of State at that time. So, Shalley called me at PACOM when I got to work and said, you know, what do you think? And I said, well, it's, it, that doesn't sound like peaceful resolution to me. <laughs> and uh, we, we, need, we should react in some way. He said, that's what we think here, too. Good thing you see it that way. So he said, come up with a plan. So at, at PACOM, one of the things, since I had come there from Washington, uh, with the staff there, we, in the military, we certainly ride for the brand. We, we, are, uh, we don't make a lot of decisions at a, you know, on a strategic level, but we make recommendations on a strategic level. But I tried to get the climate on the PACOM staff to be, there are not a bunch of people in DC that know the right answer to this stuff. And there's probably not, not people back there, there are probably not people back there that know any more about it than we do. And if they do, we shouldn't be here. You know, we ought to know more than they do. So we, we came together, we put together a plan. And uh, what we looked at a couple of things, uh, four specifically, is who are we trying to influence here? First, we're trying to influence the PRC that 
uh, firing the missiles is something that's not in the interest of them or Taiwan or us. The second is to influence Taiwan to make sure they knew that the United States support here is not an endorsement or a blank check. You know, that we're doing this, but this is not licensed for you to do whatever you choose from the people of Taiwan. Also in the United States, to have the president have something to tell uh, the people of the United States that we're supporting our laws, the Taiwan Relations Act, and doing that. And then the fourth audience is our allies in the area that the United States is an ally that can be counted on, that we will honor our commitments and we'll do what we, uh, what we should do under treaty obligations. So that was the context that we were working. The fifth thing, when you think about this, 1996, it's seven years after Tiananmen Square. So relationships with China have been going pretty well overall. We didn't want to overreact in a way that would cause the Chinese to say, you have overreacted against, the, against China. We tried to do it in a, in a measured way. So what we did is we, uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to truncate this to get close to five minutes anyway. You're already over five I minutes, Joe. I, I was about to say, okay, how did it turn out? Okay, <laughs> it turned out pretty well. So any questions <laughs> about that? <laughs> but, Anyhow, there, there are a couple of, uh, we, I won't go into all the tactics of it, but we moved naval forces, and we never, if you <clears throat> ask most people about this that care about it, they'll say there were two carrier battle groups in the Taiwan Straits. Not the case at all. On purpose, we had the independence battle group happen to be in the Philippines, and we moved them out, and we moved them about 200 miles to the, uh, to the east of Taiwan. One, tactically gave them operating room to work, and the other is they were not up in the, in the Taiwan Straits. And so then we put two ships, one close to Taipei and one off of Kaohsiung, uh, Aegis missile ships, which had a, have a... East or west? Uh, north or south. But, but were they east or, in other words, was it between Taiwan and the mainland, or was it? No, they were not between Taiwan right. and the mainland. But they had a, uh, a technical capability to intercept missiles. Uh, they, a small envelope, but they could do it, you know, if, if, it, if the conditions were right. We didn't talk about that too much. But then the, uh, so they were there, and what, we, what happened was is nothing, there were no results because we hadn't advertised this. We just put the ships in place and we thought intelligence systems would do this. Nothing happened. So we finally had to cut the media in on it. And you don't, you know, that's not a vernier switch. It's an on-off <laughs> switch once you do that. And so they all wanted carrier visits and stuff like that. Anyway, that had, that had the, uh, I'll get, go quickly here. It had okay, the desired effect. China shot five missiles and then stopped. Uh, so that was, that, that seemed good. Uh, also, Bill Perry added on the Nimitz, which steamed out of the Persian Gulf, which really didn't get there until after everything was already over and done. But the fact that they had steamed from there and we'd ad advertised that they were coming from the Persian Gulf, that, that had an effect. And that went between Taiwan and the mainland, the Nimitz. Sub subsequently. Subsequently. Yeah. yeah. And the Bella Wood ship went through there. And what's the lesson? The lesson was the Chinese, after the fact, uh, said, you put the carrier independence out there to support independence for Taiwan. <laughs> and I said, you give us too much credit <laughs> for planning. Uh, the uh, Kai is the one that made that comment. And Kai also made the comment about you were bluffing, weren't you? And, said we, we weren't bluffing, but of course the military guy is not the one that gets to say that. But the lessons we learned is we did not have communications with the Chinese military, with the PLA. There are a lot of subsequent uh, stories of this, but we tried to build communications with the PLA. Uh, it was awkward. It was not necessarily well received in our country, by some, by, well received by some, not by others. 
but we gradually built a relationship with the PLA and also a, a started to build a healthy relationship between PACOM and the leadership in China. There one, one can ask questions about the, the Chinese response to that, but I don't, it's, it's, there are those who say that the Chinese military buildup started after that that it created a fundamental break in the assumptions that had existed from 1979. You, you could say that. One, one other you, thing I... I don't say it, but yeah, people have said it. An un, unnamed source, unnamed right? Source. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, well, let me go to Denny. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's talk about, you know, the Belgrade bombing, the Hainan incident. I think Joe's covered the you know, the, the, the 96 stuff, and how did, you know, how did that change the U.S.-China security relationship? And then also, I think you were PACOM commander during 9-11. And how right. did that change kind of the way we thought about U.S.-China uh, relations? Well, we, well, we can talk about it, individual incidents, but I, I thought I might give a little bit of background on what we were trying to do in terms of our overall relationship with the PLA at that uh, at that point, coming on the uh, the heels of what Joe described with the uh, with the confrontation in 90, 96, um, uh, it, by that time, the Chinese military buildup had been underway for probably five to eight years. They had decided in the early nineteen nineties uh, that no longer would military modernization be the fourth of four and lowest priority, but there was enough wealth in the country that that more resources should be given to the armed forces to uh, b build it up to protect China's interests uh, uh, broadly. So we, we, it, it was before 96 that, uh, that uh, China had decided to build up its armed forces. And uh, we, we saw that there were two possibilities. Either was China was building up these armed forces to uh, try to force the United States out of East, East Asia, to try to, uh, in the worst, ex worst instance, uh, use these military forces to uh, fulfill their territorial ambitions in Taiwan or, or, or South China Sea or the Sen Senkakus, or else um, China was using this as a traditional part of military of, of a national uh, power to uh, just increase its general influence in the region, economic, uh, diplomatic, uh, and and military. I, I pretty much I saw my job as trying to as trying to influence them to choose the latter uh, course. We didn't want to turn this into either a military confrontation or an arms race, uh, but certainly uh, China would have armed forces the way all big countries did, and we would uh, we would. Uh, jostle each other, but it would be understood that uh, we, we were not looking for some sort of a showdown. So to accomplish that goal, there were sort of three uh, major ideas that we tried to get across to the Chinese, or I tried to get across in my conversations with them. Uh, the first one was to convince the Chinese that our interests in the, uh, what they call the first island chain, what, what we call Japan, Philippines, <laughs> Korea, <laughs> Taiwan, <laughs> Uh, was as great a, was as great as theirs. Uh, we would get this argument frequently that well, we're closer, we're bigger. This is more important to us. This is far away for you. It's optional. Uh, therefore, over time, we're going to be dominant. You guys are going to pull out because it's just not that important to us. And to try to get through to the Chinese that the entire American security structure uh, in East Asia, the most dynamic part of the world, a uh, place where we had strong alliances, depended on us keeping our keeping our promises, and although our promise to, uh, to uh, Taiwan was not unconditional, uh, we didn't take their side no matter what, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it did have a, a, a real part of it, and if we walked away from that, uh, that would unravel our entire structure in Japan, Korea, elsewhere. So we, part of our force was to try to convince them that our interests in that part of the world were as strong as theirs. Uh, the second one was to try to convince them of the futility of an arms race with the United States in maritime and air uh, spaces where we enjoyed a tremendous uh, historical uh, ad advantage and in which uh, over time we just didn't think a continental power like China was going to be able to 
match the United States. We'd stood one of those off before the Soviet Union before. We could do it again. You're just not going to push the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Uh, Air Force out of uh, that part of the world. And then the third, the third piece was the more positive one, which was to, to, to try to uh, convince the Chinese that there were lots of common interests uh, in which you would use military forces that we ought to be working on, and these range from the traditional humanitarian response, uh, dealing with, uh, dealing with uh, disasters through maintaining general order on the, um, on the, uh, on the high seas uh, against uh, illegal, uh, illegal activities, and these are things we ought to be working on uh, together. And I, I, I would use the term security communities, developing security communities for this uh, uh, purpose, and try to draw the Chinese uh, into that. Uh, at the time, I didn't know which way China was going to go, and I thought it would be a foolish person who would predict uh, which way China was going to develop. I would talk to people who said, oh, wait a minute, uh, China, as it develops a strong middle class and economically powerful, is inevitably going to become a benevolent status quo uh, power, and so just, uh, you know, lie down and take a, take a nap about military confrontation, Admiral, uh, this is all going to work out just fine. And on the other hand, you would get the, uh, the people, oh, there's this diabolical uh, Chinese plot there, uh, bound on a military, uh, a military superiority scheme, and you, have to, uh, and you have to stop them now because it's going to be more difficult later. Uh, I didn't know which one of these is true, and I still don't today know which way China is going to uh, develop. So I thought, try to work for uh, uh, what I thought would be a, a good uh, outcome for both uh, countries, and, and yet be ready in case it uh, turned uh, in, in turned to another direction. So that was 15 years ago. What do I think now in terms of uh, the way China is developing? I think the answer to that question is still unknown. However, I do think that China is seeing more uh, mileage to be gained from a strong uh, military uh, capability than perhaps it uh, did in the past, and it definitely is building up and pushing its weight around on the, in that part of the world on the basis of feeling that it is, uh, it is uh, uh, much stronger relative to uh, the other countries there, and it's only the United States, in fact, that, uh, that uh, surpasses it in overall military uh, capability, and they still think that we don't live there, that uh, this is their part of the <laughs> world. So I think the, the, uh, the basic uh, question is still is still not known to the Chinese, to us, to anybody else. And I still think our fundamental strategy should be to, uh, to make sure that military force cannot be uh, used by China in a way that would advance their inter interests, and yet to still try to emphasize the way that we ought to uh, be working together and the way that, uh, in fact, uh, East Asia can be big enough for both of us. Great. Admiral Keating. Uh, 2007 to 2009, uh, a time when we had a huge arms sale to Taiwan, which I guess caused the Chinese to deny uh, the Kitty Hawk um, a port visit. Um, and then you had this enormous earthquake in right. Chengdu where you played a role in kind of uh, disaster assistance. So what lessons from your period and that apply today? Joe mentioned it, and I think Denny and Sam, all of us have had the same frustration in trying to talk to the, our counterparts in the PLA. Remarkably challenging. Uh, with the Kitty Hawk incident issue, I once mentioned incident, the Kitty Hawk was families had come down from Japan for the, from the crew and the air wing. Ship was making final preparations to come into Hong Kong for Thanksgiving holiday, well-earned uh, rest and relaxation. And our country announced an arms sales uh, to Taiwan, and at the literally last, about an hour before Kitty Hawk would have dropped her anchor in Hong Kong Harbor, uh, the Chinese denied her permission to enter port. Um, families already, that I mentioned, there are already families in Hong Kong, uh, and these aren't folks who can just get a Gulf Stream and zip back <laughs> up and forth. So that was very frustrating. Um, so at, at the time, I wanted to call somebody. I mean, let me get on a horn and talk to somebody at the, in the joint staff. And the Chinese, they actually have the temerity to not align their military departments exactly as we do, uh, the, the nerve. Anyway, I, I, I tried calling, but a very frustrating part of my time in, 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 at SyncPAC was I never could get a phone number. I'd tell these guys, I'd go to their office and I'd see their cell phones and they had phones and, you know, they're massive communication. 
every office called me, I please have your phone number. I said, you've got a phone, can I have your phone number? Just inscrutable. Never had a phone number. So we couldn't call anybody. So Kitty Hawk uh, turns around and starts to go home. I thought, well, this might be a nice time to ask for a Taiwan Strait Transit <laughs> Passage Authority. Uh, that didn't sell. So <laughs> Kitty Hawk went back to uh, uh, Yokosuka. Um, on the two humanitarian assistance issues, it, it, it falls, it dovetails nicely. We were building on all of the strategy that Joe and Denny and others had developed over the decades at uh, Pacific Command, a uh, partnership and presence. We launched a couple of C-17s without telling the Chinese they were coming, because as I mentioned, we couldn't call them. So we just launched them out of Alaska, loaded up with cold weather stuff. And asked for permission to land at, uh, uh, at an airfield nearby through the embassy and were given permission. At this time, there was this, there was, it was advertised that, well, you've got a hotline to Beijing. Um, we had, we, by this time now, we had a phone number on the red switch. Many of you know what a red switch is. It's this big secure telephone that sits next to your desk or your bed. And, um, I pick it up and, and through the comm guys, they, it rang for 45 minutes. We had a, we were there on the clock. It rang for 45 minutes until we could get somebody in the Chinese Pentagon, if you will, to answer the phone. And when they did, we said we're offered a sign of friendship and partnership. So they let the two airplanes land. We did the same thing uh, for, uh, there was a cold snap and an earthquake. And in both cases, we launched two C-17s loaded to the gills with stuff and got them close to Chinese airspace before they would, uh, uh, before we told them they were coming and then in both cases they were kind of compelled to let us go. So the, the frustrating part for us at, in Hawaii was communications at all levels up and down the chains of command uh, with the PLA. Got through to them eventually, but in one case it took 45 minutes of, somebody was sitting there looking at the f phone <laughs> ringing. Had to have been, and I, I think Joe may have had similar stories of communication during the EP3 crisis. It, it's a singularly frustrating aspect of uh, our dealings with the PLA. Was that was the earthquake recovery? Uh, did the, was there a Chinese a terrible uh, helicopter crash in the PLA? Was that the one? And did they approach us uh, to supply parts for? <clears throat> the helicopters which we previously sold them, which would have been more effective in disaster assistance? Uh, that, that, would that have come through PACOM or through the State Department? State Department. I, I remember the issue. I don't remember the decision. Blackhawks. Yeah. In other words, Blackhawks, which have now been cannibalized. We sold them, I think, seven Blackhawks is my recollection, and they've been cannibalized to the point that they're not usable and they would have been more effective in the the some of our in system. industry partners would be happy to provide parts for any airplane anywhere, but uh, I, I don't remember, I don't know the, the incident that precipitated the request, I don't remember if it was a crash or just general. Danny, you but on, Tim, on Tim's point of communication, I think the primary reason for these frustrating delays is because the uh, Chinese, uh, the PLA did not know what they were going to say when they yeah. picked up the phone and they needed 45 minutes to Try to uh, try to figure figure it out. I mean, I think one thing you have to add. Are the only caller on that phone, or do they have caller ID? <laughs> no, they they they, uh, they can tell you can okay. tell who's they calling. Can, you can tell who's calling. Yeah, but do. I mean, the ed education of a senior Chinese military officer, a PLA officer, is provincial in the literal sense of the word. They do not deal with anybody outside of first one of the military regions and then outside of China until they are very senior, they don't, they're not used to dealing with other navies, other armies, other, other armed forces, so it's a, uh, there's not a system there of, ha of how you answer the phone, make the in initial replies that you can make at a junior level, then th refer, thing, refer things up. So I, I think the frustration is uh, primarily due to lack of uh, China coming to Chinese, uh, the PLA coming to grips with how it is going to deal with people that it mainly thinks of as wartime opponents. That's how PLA officers think of yep. Americans 99% of the time. Uh, the people who are frustrating their national ambitions, that people are gonna have to fight, and we're supposed to. Should we be training them? Should we be having more well, of them here so that, in fact, when they do go back, 
that they will communicate with our armed forces? Or does that just, is there just too much bad stuff that can happen as a result of that? We, we think we should be training them and be, be talking to them and working, that, working this issue. They don't, they don't necessarily agree with that. You know, they, the PLA works for the party. I think we prohibit, uh, from my recollection is not wrong, we prohibit PLA folks from coming here and training from Chinese citizens from attending West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy. It's the, I mean, I it's really complicated. That to the Chinese, they would say yes. It, it's very complicated, Steve. It has to do with uh, reciprocity with Taiwan. There are midshipmen at the Naval Academy from Taiwan. China will not send uh, a midshipman from China until, until we refuse to provide the same education to Taiwan. There's a difference between training and education. Education is, you know, the broad principles. It does not compromise classified information. Training is, have to be, has to be carefully calibrated on what it is you're training for. You don't train sharpshooters in authoritarian governments. Uh, just <laughs> for, for an example, uh, you, 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 uh, it, it's, it's worth changing, training how you get organized to uh, do humanitarian as assistance. So, uh, so, yeah, I think what we object to in the armed forces is, um, is uh, you know, the, the government leaders t uh, using uh, normal military interactions as a stick to beat uh, right. China with because they just in general think that uh, nothing good comes out of that country. So uh, if we don't like what China's doing, we cut off all forms of military cooperation. If we do it like what they're doing, we'll open it all up. I, I, I think what most of us believe is that you should be more discriminate. You should contact, train, educate on the things that are in your mutual interest. You should not on the things that are not in your uh, interest. Well, and it's never clear. Some of these training exercises have benefits to interaction, and some we're training them to do stuff we may not want them to ultimately do. No, it really is clear. You can sort it, that it out. It really is clear. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. RIMPAC. It started under you, Sam. First time the Chinese participated in RIMPAC. Good? Bad? Are we just training them to do stuff which may not ultimately be in our interests? Well, I think that my general sense at that time, and there was opposition, I think, um, among people in Washington. There was opposition among some of our allies, and there was opposition internally within the U.S. Navy for some, some, some quarters because of this issue of or what are we training the Chinese to do at this stage. Uh, of course, the RIMPAC is the largest multinational or operation, training operation in the world. And it is in a relatively benign area, so it's in the Hawaiian island chain and the vast sea space. And there is a humanistic point to it as well where the ships come in I think an average of impact maybe have 50 to 60 ships from from 20, you know, 15 to 20 different countries participating any any time. So it seemed odd to me that you wouldn't bring in China, who now had a navy able to come that far and to participate in a way. And the things in all countries choose what they wanted to participate in. So it's not you. It's kind of wagon wheel things, and you allow people to do things. So there was a negotiation process between uh, between the U.S. and China on what they would do. They came to impact. Uh, they perform well. Uh, their sailors were respectful. They were socially engaged. Uh, but it was, they didn't, weren't engaged across all activities there. But, it, but I think in general it turned out to be uh, much more in the plus column than it, than it would have been if they had been left out of RIMPAC. And I certainly felt that, as Denny has said, the, the last thing you want to do is to have your mill-to-mill -mill relations to be the first thing you use as a hammer when your diplomatic uh, chain starts to fray. Uh, the, because of that, you want the people to have the guns understanding each other, not be feeling that there's a, a large political abyss between them, because this creates, I think, uncertainty in their mind, can create fear, and can re lead to miscalculation. So, you know, the Chinese have good senior leaders like we do. And if you give them and we give our senior leaders the ability to know each other, the ability to communicate, there's value in that in, cre in preventing unintended consequences when, when ships and Marines and, and soldiers meet 
and there are unexpected consequences. How you can manage that escalation internally can be very important. So do you mean to, 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 to you want to talk about anything else during my time there? Or? No, no, no. I, 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 now, now, now you have yeah. your full time about the challenges you were facing during that yeah. period, and, and uh, <laughs> obviously land reclamation was the big, well, the biggest it, thing going on during that. It, it time. was it was one of many. Um, so the one of the, the difficult parts of being PACOM is you inherit everything else that all the other PACOM commanders have done before you. <laughs> And so the didn't notice the, you turning down the jobs. So. Right, it didn't turn down the job. <laughs> and, and there's goodness, and there's there's others in that. Uh, it's a long way from the flagpole. So, <laughs> so when I came in, what I observed was uh, the U.S. Uh, military was reaching a uh, a very strained point because of global operations, particularly in in the, in the Middle East, that were draining the joint force. And over time, during the the, the ten or twelve years that that was happening much of the U.S. force structure in the Pacific was being tapped to put in the Middle East. And so there was a degradation of military capability in the Asia Pacific that, that was visible, I think, uh, to our allies and our partners and were probably visible at some point in time to the Chinese as well. Um, and so that's where we found the U.S. in when I, when I came in. Um, the uh, Chinese, however, uh, had changed over time and were uh, evolving their military, evolving their capability, as we talked about some of the things that might have motivated them, but evolved them to be uh, what I would call not a, maybe not a first world military, but certainly approaching some aspects of a regional power. And so we kind of entered that at that, at that stage. So if you think about um, where the Chinese were at that time, they have a strategy by necessity of change. They couldn't go from where they were in the 70s to where they want to be in 2050 without changing things. And military is a part of that. The U.S., on the other hand, has been pretty happy with the arrangements we've had in the Asia Pacific for 70 years or, or more. So we really have a strategy of status quo. So if you put those two strategies in the same sphere with each other, they're, they're incompatible. You can't have status quo and change operating. So it's going to create friction points. And those friction points as China matures and the U.S. Um, matures as well as a mature power, those friction points uh, I think become uh, more, uh, more apparent and they become more difficult. So the friction points that occurred when I was there were uh, in Northeast Asia were the Senkaku, uh, Daiyu Islands. And the, and the concern between the Chinese and the Japanese who, who we have a huge stake with the Japanese as a long-term ally. And that has a tendency to start redefining U.S. alliance position in Northeast Asia, as well as starting to shape the Chinese for what they think may be important to them there. The Taiwan situation, if you move a little further south, was I think most of the time I was there was in a uh, better than average place because of the relationships, the positive things that the mainland had been doing with Taiwan at that time. Uh, and I thought that was, was in a uh, st strategic equilibrium of some, to some degree and that all parties kind of understood where the U.S. stood, where the Taiwanese stood, and as well as mainland China. So, uh, of course, uh, North Korea uh, became very uh, evident on the scene, not that it hadn't been popping up over time many, many times in the past, but it... Uh, with, a new, with the new, with the introduction of the third generation and probably I think the most dangerous generation in North Korea, this now put a, a, a different uh, quality, as you see in the news today, and it puts a different uh, timeline for how uh, powers in the region and the U.S. have to start thinking about how to deal with North Korea. To some degree, you had a rising ASEAN uh, block in the south, southeast China, where uh, I never saw it as a security block, but certainly these, um, I think there's 11 or 12 countries that are in there, were starting to uh, exert their uh, feelings about what they thought was their, uh, what they thought belonged to them in the South China Sea in particular, and, and, and the influence that they should have. And they were in a position of having to kind of walk a fine line between their long-term relationships with the U.S. as a security guarantor in the region and an emerging China. And how they walked that line was, 
was pretty interesting. And then, of course, you throw on top of that now the, the issue of South China Sea and the Nine Dash Line. So you see uh, China redefining uh, their priorities among these different friction points. And you see the U.S. now having to do the same thing. So the U.S. embarked upon the rebalance. Now the rebalance was, I think, primarily motivated by, by military leaders, um, some of these sitting on the stage here, who said, hey, look, uh, if you think about where U.S. interests lie in the 21st century, you need to get it right in uh, Asia and the Pacific. And you need to get it right not just on the military side, but you need to get it right across economic, social, and everything else. Because even though it's 50% of the world, 83% is water, but on the 17% that's in PACOM, six out of every 10 people alive today live there. And it'll go to seven out of 10 by the middle of the century. And all, that's where all the middle income earners in the world, the growth of middle income earners are gonna happen in Asia and Southeast Asia in this. It's a commercial so we want to have for the rebalance. So the rebalance had the, the, the so the rebalance was about all was supposedly about all those things. So I'd say it was a it was a recognition by and that, this time by President Obama administration that if you want to maintain status quo in, in Asia uh, in favor of your interests, then you need to get back in Asia in a way that Asians can understand why you're there and what you're doing. So to some degree, I think that's where it probably faltered, was that it was never really clear on how, what it was supposed to look like at the end. Uh, and I think we missed some opportunities. You know, the TPP, you've heard people say that, that the TPP was, uh, was more important than almost any military uh, thing you could have done in Asia for security there. And we, and, you know, we missed the boat. Look, let, me, um, let me focus a little on the elephant in the room, which is North Korea. Um, I understand that the PACOM commander's job is to give options to the president and let the president decide. Uh, Defense Secretary Mattis said a military solution to North Korea would be tragic on an unbelievable scale and that we should work with the UN, China, Japan, South Korea, what really are our military. So, the question is, if that's the view, what really are our military options in, with respect to North Korea? The Trump administration has talked about this concept of surgical strikes, which I don't fully understand. But can any of you shed light on what really our military options are if all of this fails? Obviously, all of this fails, so at some point, the president would say it becomes an existential threat to the United States. They have the ability to send a nuclear armed missile that hits the United States. And what do we do? Let me walk you back a second on that. Because the, the, the military cannot solve big problems. What they can do is create room, space, and time for these solutions to occur. And usually they are political problems and communications problems. And so the, uh, to, you know, in, in the Korea instance, a, what I have great confidence in Jim Mattis and, and that the, the military effort should certainly include the Chinese who do have leverage in North Korea, and they they might try to, um, you know. Sometimes they say they don't, but they've got a fair they've got more influence than we do there. So I think the I think that that bit of, the business of communicating with China is uh, is critical in this issue. But I'm positing failure, failure of diplomatic, failure of secondary sanctions, failure. What are the military options? Well, you know, Steve, we've dealt with this. We've dealt with a situation of countries that are hostile to the United States developing nuclear weapons. You know, happened first with uh, Soviet Union, happened second with uh, with China. Uh, you, there is there is always the there is always a discussion within the United States of uh, uh, should we can we. Uh, try to uh, destroy them by 
mili military means uh, before they before they become big, or should they or should they not? Uh, I, I think the situation in um, in North Korea is is a lot more. It, it is not the sort of um, enormous change when they develop an ICBM uh, capable of reaching the United States, but it, it lies along a, a gradation. Ever since uh, North Korea had these crude weapons that they developed maybe seven or eight years ago, they can kill lots of Americans. There are lots of Americans who are in Korea, the servicemen, their families, businessmen, uh, others, and so necessarily a lot, a lot of Americans would be are, are under, under, under threat there. Uh, the, North Koreans are masters of, uh, of uh, unconventional means of delivering, uh, well, unconventional means of doing everything. Uh, they, they, they can tuck one of these uh, crude warheads, which is uh, about the size of half of the stage, into a fishing boat, a submarine, and, uh, and work it to other places in Korea and Japan, even across the Pacific, into, into the United States. So this is a range of, a ra range of threats. And the way that the United States has generally chosen to handle these things is to is uh, through deterrence to make it clear that uh, if a, another country does use these weapons against us or our allies, uh, we're going to retaliate, and that mutual knowledge has kept things quiet. I don't, uh, I don't think that that way of thinking has been completely upset by North Korea. It's still something that has to be thought through, uh, but uh, I would say the alternative to uh, the alternative to, to a uh, an uncertain military strike uh, that North Koreans have thousands of tunnels. Uh, they could have these parts of the nuclear system squirreled away in uh, all sorts of places. Uh, last time we thought we knew where North, North Korean nuclear uh, capability was being developed, we had one challenge under the Cato Agreement. We used that challenge. We pointed to a particular tunnel and said, uh, we want to go there and look at, uh, look at it, and we think that there are nuclear uh, uh, nuclear material being developed there. Uh, we went in, looked in the tunnel. It was it was empty. It's very hard to it's very hard to uh, be certain. And if I were the director of national intelligence again, and the president said, um, "Okay, here's there's General Mattis's strike plan. Uh, can you assure me that this will take care take out all of the North Korean military capability?" Uh, it'd be a brave DNI who would say who would say yes. So it. No. <laughs> right. Admiral Keating or Admiral Ackler, anything on? So it's a judgment, yep. I, I would say, and there are alternatives. There are a wide range of options, some of which have been exercised, some of which have been discussed. All of them are classified, so we can't go into them here, but you should know that there are a wide range of options readily available to the President and the Secretary of Defense resident in the planning uh, warrants at Pacific Command. Yeah, just because it's tragic doesn't mean you won't do it. <clears throat> if, the, if the national interests are high enough, and I think this is the mistake that uh, Kim Jong-un needs to really think about, is that you start really pressing on the, 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 you know, an issue that has to do with survival of the United States against a nuclear attack, the, the tragic becomes conceivable to stop it. So I think that we have to be very, caught, very he, that regime has to be very careful and the, and the partners in the region who need to help manage expectations in North Korea and the outcome here need to be aware of the, how fast this thing has, has changed over time. And that could be tragic. Because of North Korea, the president seems to have ordered PACOM, uh, unclassified, New York Times story, has ordered PACOM to stop freedom of navigation exercises in the South China Sea. Do you guys think that's a good idea? The Carl Vinson Battle Group has been operating in the South China Sea for the last four months. Uh, that's the most powerful sign that the United States will use its military forces as it needs to to protect, protect its interests, quite independently of whether you went six miles from this little reef or five miles from, uh, from that. So, the, so why do we ever bother with, with these phone ops? Well, the, the, the Freedom of Navigation Operations is, has always been a technical program in which we challenge individual 
interpretations of the, of the law of the sea on individual features. And there are, last I saw, several hundred of those. And every, every month, every six months, we send a ship or an airplane by to challenge them. The issue in the South China Sea is much bigger than one island, one three mile limit versus a 12 mile limit versus, it's China seeks to have a veto over military operations in that area just as they seek such a veto uh, off their coast to about 200 miles or so. The United States is not going to put up with that. Uh, the way we demonstrate that we're not going to put up with that is by operating uh, primarily maritime and air forces in that theater, uh, both in peacetime and to protect, protect our interests. So that's how we assert our, our freedom of navigation. And because these two concepts have gotten mixed, the, the little transit to show that uh, that was an incorrect baseline badly drawn between two islands and the fundamental principle that the United States will operate its uh, military forces in what we consider international waters uh, is regrettable and we ought to straighten that out. But I would say that with the deployment of the Vincent Battle Group, which is the first time, <clears throat> back to Sam's point, uh, first time in about two years that we have been operated a Pacific Battle Group entirely within East Asia as opposed to making a brush pass for about two weeks and then sending it on to the Persian Gulf is a pretty powerful uh, freedom of navigation, uh, in fact the most powerful pre freedom of navigation demonstration. So that, that's sort of the situation if you turn around and look at it from the uh, what's really important here. Uh -huh. Do you guys have Admiral Keating? Lockley, you agree One, with there, that? there were folks who were saying that uh, <clears throat> there was some confusion as to the location of the Vincent Battle Group. <laughs> that's pretty, that's, that's correct. Not everybody did know where it was, and that's exactly what was intended. We're going to move around out, we, they are going to move around out there at speeds and courses uh, of their choosing and they may or may not be uh, making themselves as visible in some ways as they are in others, and that's an option that we're going to exercise, and we did very effectively. So it was perceived as Jim Mattis doesn't know where the battle group is. He knew where it was, and they knew where they were, just the folks we didn't want to know where it, there's too many pronouns here, but <laughs> <laughs> we reserve the right not to disclose everything we're doing. I think some people got some tenses wrong that may have seriously misled our allies. So I don't know if, you know, when you publicly say that uh, a carrier group is heading north when it's heading south and you have tied it to what is going on on the Korean Peninsula, I'm not sure. And of course, everybody who needed to know knew re really where it was, but I don't think that's a good that's a good way to handle diplomacy. Perhaps it's not the only carrier we have out there, the Vincent, at that time. There were, there was at least one more around, so it perhaps the, the strategic communications piece wasn't as thoroughly uh, parsed as it should have been, but there was a method, there was folks who needed to know knew exactly what was going on. Sam, anything on that one? Well, not specifically on the, the Carl Vinson. I mean, I, I'm kind of the school that that carrier, carriers in general, that's why you have them, so you can move them around. And I think the fact that, that we have uh, increased the level of maritime presence in general and Marine Corps presence, which maritime, in Asia uh, during the period of the last several years uh, should be a pretty strong message to people, about our allies and our partners and our friends about our commitment to, to there, but the North Korea problem, not just about an aircraft carrier, I mean, that's just one element of power. It has to do with, a, with a, a, a multitude of things that you have to do to defend yourself, to defend your allies, to defend American families and, and service members that are on the, in Japan, that are on the, uh, the uh, in, in South Korea, that are all through that region, as well as how do you uh, deter a potential strike against Hawaii or the west coast of the United States should North Korea have that capability. And so you start negotiating things like that, radars and things that make the, the Chinese really uncomfortable. And I say, hey, <laughs> uh, you know, this is what we're gonna have to do if, if this, this uh, rogue uh, uh, North Korea uh, regime continues on this path, it's gonna get harder for everybody. And so we need some help here. And I think that 
the Chinese are positioned to be to do more than I observed uh, in my time to be able to help bring this to to this conclusion. But my the my theory on it is that the reason they haven't is because they distrust us more than they worry about the consequences of North Korea. What do you think when, when that scale tips over, then maybe they'll, they'll be able to do more. You know, Steve, it's interesting to notice the, the difference in the tactics that North Korea is using. I think when, certainly when Joe, Joe and I were there, uh, provocations were the, right. were what China, and they, these, were, these were unexpected military actions, uh, sending uh, special forces teams into South Korea to try to kidnap or kill somebody, uh, shelling, an, shelling an island, uh, or even more recently, this uh, sinking of the Chonan. This was use yeah. of military forces in uh, a way that was a surprise, but kept below the level of lighting off a major war with the, uh, major war with the United States, which the North Koreans knew they, knew they would lose. Um, the, recently, what you see is Things that are done completely internally but pose a threat, which are development of their missile program and development of their nuclear program. These don't touch anybody until they, until they do. And then the second thing are these cyber, these cyber attacks against Sony. Maybe they were involved in, and maybe the North Koreans were involved in this Bangladesh uh, SWIFT uh, program uh, uh, break-in. Uh, maybe, they, maybe they've been involved in, in WannaCry, this, uh, this latest one. So I think what we have to, rethink is this balance of, uh, of reaction to North Korean uh, provocation, which has quite changed in character from very recently, five years ago or so. And they, they're, the North Koreans are playing to things which they think will um, get the uh, objectives that they want, which are concessions in terms of uh, economics and recognition and safety and, and so on, and run lesser risk of setting off a war with the United States, either conventional or nuclear, which they will, uh, yeah. which they will lose. Well, okay. His father blew up a, an aircraft with half the Korean cabinet on it. Right, I right. Mean, th this is not recent. This is, I, I would argue, this is not so new. Well, they've been doing. No, it's different though. Uh, they, they haven't attacked. A, they a, killed half the cabinet. No, I, I, what I'm telling <laughs> you is they're serious. using different tactics now from what they used in those uh, days. Part of it also is the old, the old saw about if you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. <laughs> and the, the North Koreans don't have diplomatic horsepower. They don't have economic horsepower. They, what they have is cyber, mm -hmm. apparently, and, and some military horsepower. And they've, they've watched Pakistan. They've watched India. They've watched other nations get nuclear weapons, and they've perhaps, perhaps helped provide those to them, and they've seen that those nations get respect from that, so they use it. Bill Perry used the phrase massive conventional retaliation, and which I think is, is a military option that could be done against North Korea. But the, the other thing that inhibits us is what I think most of us think is Seoul would be uh, heavily damaged, you know, if, if if any attack were, were a military attack were done on North Korea, but it, I, I think one of the pro I think one of the problems with North Korea that I that I observe it seems to me that that this particular regime needs an antagonist. It needs an antagonist to stay in power. Uh, otherwise, why would 28 million Koreans do what they do? I think they do it out of fear. They, they a fear generated by a regime that makes them fear. A nuclear strike by the United States. I mean, I recall being told one night that that during one of the exercises with South Korea that the that there were cities in North in North Korea that the entire city had been rolled out in the middle of the night and put in the gas mask and put in those the shelters because they were being told that the United States and the South Koreans were going to do a nuclear strike on them and and they were kept there for hours in in fear and so. The fact that they need an antagonist, I think, makes it the set of options to have how you maybe even negotiate. You know, there's talk about well, let's have a negotiated settlement with them, give them a few nukes, let them you know make a deal with them. <laughs> I don't know that you can get there. I don't know. I don't think that's in the, in their best interest. I think they need what they have. They like you know they need this this antagonism. You've all talked about the need to improve communications with the PLA. Is there? Are there other things that we could be doing to improve the 
mill-to-mill -mill relationship? Sure, and they're, on, they're ongoing. Uh, a fellow we all know, uh, Air Force Three Star Dan Fig Leaf, was at the uh, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Was that? Yeah. And in his tenure, which is he's he's just left, uh, and, and we talked about this a little bit. Earlier, there were Taiwan students in attendance, and through his efforts, we he they now have. PLA and Taiwanese students in the same classroom at the same time taking the same course, which is unheralded on purpose, but is a, obviously a pretty significant breakthrough. So that is an example of true progress made largely on the efforts of one guy. Other areas? The, the communications piece in general, I think is something, uh, what, what Tim just talked about is, is critically important, but the, you know, the whole relationship, not Korea, U.S.-China relations here, is, uh, is the people that do business in China see the same thing as creating a relationship is the, the ground base of moving forward. And uh, I think the, I, I've had just a John Jaman punch, Punch me in the chest. I didn't have a mic on then, but they uh, <laughs> still have the bruise. But he uh, saying, you know, "What are you trying to do with the PLA to generate uh, generate communications?" And I said, "We're trying to build trust so we don't miscalculate." What we've been talking about here all afternoon, and uh, he made a comment that before you can have trust, you must have understanding, and before you can have understanding, you must have communications. And then he went on to say that more Chinese speak English than do Americans. And so, but the, uh, he, the, the point being, I think, with the PLA is just like uh, starting a business relationship, it's you don't go in with a flotilla of lawyers. You go in and you, tra you, build, you, have to, you have to work at the base up and build a relationship. And I think that's what needs to happen at a, you know, at a junior officer level, and it's, it's hard because the Chinese do not trust us. You know, and I, uh, so it, it is, it's a struggle to get that going. And we have different interests, you know, we, 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 we have to acknowledge that. I, I think communications between uh, the United States Armed Forces and the PLA are overrated as a, um, as a uh, tool that will somehow uh, keep things peaceful when other forces are other forces are pushing you uh, there. I, I think it's more derivative than it is than it is causal. Um, in this EP3 crisis, when I was in Honolulu and Ambassador Preer was in uh, in in Be Beijing, um, there were there were uh, no communications for several days until the Chinese decided that this would be the channel, and it was from the ambassador to a particular, I think, Ministry of Foreign Affairs yeah. uh, official that you were set up and that was how all of the business was done and it, if I'd had a phone number, if, uh, if uh, anybody else had had a phone number, it wouldn't have made any difference because uh, this, was, uh, this was what happens when things get, things get serious. So I, I think it's kind of marginal. I think it's, I think it's, we all think it's bad if there's a com there are complete misconceptions on both sides uh, and you can, you can sort of, you can smooth some of those off by contact. Navies are particularly good at it because we have a common enemy, the ocean, which, uh, which we spend most of our time uh, de dealing with, and that develops a certain amount of camaraderie and co common understanding. It's much rarer army, army to army uh, considerations, and that's all good, but it's not going to be decisive in terms of changing this fundamental uh, cooperative, con confrontative relationship that we have. As, as former can, can, can I add one thing to that? I think, I think that's certainly true. But the part of it is because the PLA developed as regional independent armies, yeah, right. you know, yeah. and so they had, they, that's right. a, a, they did not have a fealty to the central government so much that, and so I think that's, that's changing. They've just restructured things. They've renamed the second artillery. They've mm -hmm. taken the geographic divisions and made them different. But uh, I think there's, it takes time to change. And, yeah. and I, I would agree with that. I think that 
one of the windows that will open as is not so much what we do, but what happens in the in the PLA in the Chinese uh, leadership structure. Yeah. So as you see these friction points occurring, I, I talked about. There's more for them to manage, more for us to manage, more for them to manage. So I think Xi Jinping did a pretty good thing. He consolidated power with the military pretty quickly. Uh, he decreased the size of the military, streamlined it, and he and I could be, see visible signs of streamlined he command and control. It, decreased the size of it. Yeah, he did decrease it, right. but he made it. Yeah. But he he put it in place. He put it, in, I think, in a context that started to, for them to be able to to use their power in a way that was better and that was more uh, focused on the areas that were important to them. So I could see that as well, and the senior leaders over about three year period of time, in fact, some of them are in the room here that were, were handling when we had, did that, that we, they, when they came the first two or three times they would, you'd see them, they would just be, you know, rope just reading off a script. Well, they gained more confidence because I think they, over time, and that became much more easy to communicate because I, my sense was that they, had better clarity of alignment to their leadership. So for us, mature PACOM, COCOM structure, we have very good alignment between us and our Secretary of Defense and our President all the time. In almost instantaneous alignment, we know what's going on. Right. Uh, since they didn't have that, but they're getting, getting it, and that'll provide, I think, uh, an opportunity for more mature dialogue as time goes on. I had a senior friend in the PLA tell me the greatest threat to U.S.-China relations is the absence of a National Security Council in China. That the, the siloed, uh, the lack of coordination between the PLA and, the, and others is, is a yeah. significant risk. Talk, can we talk about the, what I consider the very odd uh, underwater drone seizure <clears throat> in December of last year? What went on and how do you think as former PACOM commanders it was handled? What were the Chinese thinking? In international waters, they didn't even argue it was their own territory. Well, I was a sea of a ship and if I was in international waters and an and a unknown object popped up beside me and it was unmanned, I would have put a hook on it and pulled it on my ship. So you would? Of course. So that's what the Chinese Yes, yeah, so I mean, I, would, and that, I wasn't surprised. I said, oh, well, they picked up the drone, so okay. <laughs> and then if I thought it was interesting, I would keep it. <laughs> and then I would have passed it to the DNI and I was to be exploited. And I, that's probably exactly what they did. However, Sam, however, <laughs> had, had that... <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Had that, vehicle, had that vehicle come from a U.S. Navy destroyer <laughs> as opposed to an unarmed um, USNS <laughs> hospital ship, I think there would have been a different... Uh, a different scene, right? This this was uh, basically the Chinese think of these uh, the, the, these uh, survey ships and unarmed survey ships as in, interlopers. They recognize that uh, they're not they're not armed. They're, they can be uh, and they and they push them around from time to time. They cut the, <laughs> cut their cables and so on. So they were they were kind of poking. Had, had there been a U.S. Navy ship involved, I think it would have been a. I mean. I would hope that the captain would not. Well, wasn't the uh, Navy right. ship approaching it to pick it up? No, mm -mm. it was the USNS. I mean, um, a yes. Outage, which is a uh, which which is a uh, which is a basically naval auxiliary auxiliary ship with an all uh, civilian crew, and it's painted with uh, 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 blue and gold bands on its. Uh, exactly. Was the impeccable a similar? Yeah. No, no, no. It, it, was was sir, sir, it was not a uh, it was not a, uh, a ship that tows an operational uh, sonar array. It was a. Um, it was a uh, sir, uh, USNS, U.S. Naval ship. But we did have a challenge with the USNS Impeccable. Right. Where the Chinese, it was a Chinese coastal fishery boat leading the harassing tactics. And it got very uh, dicey. And so the, the master of the Impeccable made a very good decision. He headed east. They were 65 miles off the coast of, of China. He headed east. And as fate would have it, uh, we got the call that he was being harassed and, and um, okay, what's the nearest United States Navy ship? It was the USS Chun Hoon, named after a World War II Admiral, Navy Cross Silver Star winner, who was of Chinese descent. It's the only <laughs> ship in the U.S. inventory that is named after a Chinese descent Admiral. So we hooked up Impeccable with Chun Hoon and told Chun Hoon uh, and Impeccable to go back where you were yesterday and resume operations, which they did without further incident from the mm, yeah, Chinese. 
And my last question, then I want to open it up. And really, you're limited to two minutes or less, which is you have two minutes with President Trump. Why what are you, you looking at me? I'm, I'm <laughs> looking at all four of you. All four of you have to. Or you can just say, listen to the video. That's the best answer. Listen to this video. Anybody want to take that one? Sure. I'll start. I would say, Mr. President, you have in the Secretary of Defense and the Commander of the Pacific Command two of the brightest folks that you could possibly ask to have at your right and left hand. They're vast experience. Uh, Jim Mattis is as smart a guy as we have in uniform. Harry Harris is a wonderful Asia Pacific scholar and leader and warrior, and I would recommend the President pay close attention to what those, those two gentlemen offer. He won't get better advice anywhere. Sam? Well, I would just ask that uh, I, I recommend that he and his leadership team spend time thinking about the complexities of Asia and uh, the complexities of U.S. interests there, U.S. allies, our historic position, rising China, uh, growing populations, humanitarian disasters. It's just, it's, it's a very, very complex environment and to approach it in a simplistic way uh, will not be good for U.S. interest. Denny? Yeah, I, I would recommend that the new administration uh, realize that overall U.S. policy, that is not only the military, but also the, the strategic and the economic and the diplomatic uh, aspects of it, has been pretty steady for about 50 years, uh, has gone across multiple administrations, has served this country extremely, extremely well. And, uh, and before you pull the plan out, in order to look at the roots and decide if you love them or not, why don't you, um, why don't you just uh, uh, make a going in assumption that uh, we're in a pretty good position in the Pacific and we uh, have had a good strategy to keep us there? Joe. Along the same lines, just that it is, uh, it's a long game. Some of these things, if you, uh, I think about the Taiwan issue, if you impetuously bring it to a head, you may get the wrong answer. And uh, normally our, you know, our disposition and that of the administration is not to kick the can down the road much, but in some cases that's not a bad strategy that we're, we're dealing with in, in Asia and, and certainly with China, it's a long game we're playing. I have dozens of more questions, but we have such a distinguished audience here. Let me open the, the First, let's Dan Rosen here, and then Jerry Cohen. Admirals, thank you very, very much. Um, to Admiral Blair's metaphor a second ago, some roots have already been pulled up out of the ground. If American geostrategic doctrine is to go in a direction of deglobalization from the president's mouth down, does that change uh, the job of PACOM vis-a-vis -vis China in particular? Deglobalization. You mean this sort of offshore balancing stuff that you hear, uh, uh, not having forward deployed forces, but uh, well, it, broadly, politically and economically as well, in terms of security commitments being contingent on transactional behavior by uh, allies, that instead of sort of maximizing American throw weight and presence in the world, we are hedging or pruning it back to some extent, so that on net the cost of American presence in the world is going to be reduced relative to the burden put on other players. And of course, that creates some amount of vacuum, I would presume. So I just wonder how PACOM mission is, is modified if that, in fact, is more than just uh, this morning's tweet. Well, look, look, at how the, look at the role of the uh, once powerful British armed forces east of, east of Suez when they decided that uh, there were other ways to handle it. I mean, of course it would change. Of course it would change it. That's a huge national decision that uh, it would have uh, not only not only military but many other but many other uh, many other con consequences. I think most of us uh, believe that uh, that um, that our forward deployed forces, our, our alliances, are of a piece in maintaining and a, a uh, st certain amount of um, security in that part of the world that allows the economic miracles that we've seen there from which the United States has benefited en enormously to, uh, to uh, take place. And, and that um, uh, unless you have a 
pretty good uh, alternative that uh, you have pretty high confidence is going to do better for your country than that, um, you, you got to think hard about abandoning it. Professor Cohen. Uh, there are two areas, I think, that deserve further consideration. We've had a pretty good beginning on North Korea. We haven't said much about the defense of Taiwan. I gather I'm limited to one question, <laughs> so I think I'd better pursue North Korea. Uh, it seemed to me Admiral Blair has given us a word of wisdom in thinking the unthinkable, since none of the other options are good. I'm not comforted to hear that we have a lot of other options that we can't be told about. We'll just leave it to the military and President Trump. That's not comforting. But Admiral Blair said, we may have to learn to live with a nuclear North Korea, the way we have learned to live with many other countries, some of which we don't have confidence in that possess nuclear weapons. So the question then becomes, how can we live with North Korea and have them retain nuclear weapons? What has to be done? It's rightly been said that they are dominated by fear. Well, if fear is really their dominant emotion, how do we then meet that? How do we build a climate of security toward North Korea, recognizing it's a very long and difficult process? We made a good start in the mid-90s under Clinton. Madeleine Albright went to Pyongyang. Clinton was rumored to be interested in going himself. We know that stopped for a while the production of nuclear weapons. I wouldn't give up on that, and it may be our best question to address which is what steps should we be taking to meet the North Koreans' need for security? And should we be negotiating directly with them instead of relying on China? The North Koreans do not like the Chinese. <laughs> it's, of course, reciprocated. Uh, I think we may do better by taking the initiative ourselves, but I'd like to hear whether this is acceptable, because I don't hear any acceptable option other than this one. Well, I, I, I don't think the dominant emotion of the North Korean regime is fear. I think it's uh, brutal, uh, repressive self-preservation. And uh, I, I, they use fear among their people in order to do it. But uh, I don't think North Korea is particularly worried about security. If you look at the litany of assurances we have offered them, including the final years of the Clinton administration, when they basically were, were offered uh, guarantees against, uh, against aggression, economic assistance, rejoining ec the, the world economic uh, system, and uh, restraint by the United States, they thought that wasn't good because that would, in, fa in effect, destroy this atmosphere of uh, being uh, th uh, threatened from the outside, which justifies the enormous brutality that they inflict on their own, their own people. So I don't, I, I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's fruitless to think that we can reassure the regime uh, enough to change their, their policies, which are not served by that kind of reassurance. So can we live with a nuclear North Korea? Yeah, I think we can deter them. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they may be developing uh, 10, 15 nu nuclear weapons. We have 20,000, we have 2,000. Um, uh, in this terrible nuclear calculus, they can do a lot of damage to the United States. Uh, there's nothing left in North Korea after a nuclear ex exchange. That's not a good regime survival strategy. I think even Kim Jong-un understands that. Bob, Peter Zek. Thank you, gentlemen. As I think so many in the audience, I feel a lot better about the safety of the United States, knowing that people like you have been protecting us. Uh, in that vein, you've dealt with a lot of civilians in the course of your careers, uh, some whom, of whom may have understood the appropriate role that you're playing and that the military plays. I would ask whoever wants to respond to this, what civilian leaders did you feel understood best what the role of the Pacific Command was uh, in the United States uh, and in the world order. I'll start. 
I think one, we all were at different times and had you know different sets of leaders for whom we worked, and uh, they uh, some of them were some were foreign. You know, like John Howard in Australia, for example, I would put on that list of people that understood that uh, extremely well. Uh, I, I mentioned Bill Perry, uh, who I think is a, a public servant non pareya. He's just a, a marvelous one. Uh, he's taken an interesting nuclear stance these days, but other than that, he's a, <laughs> he's a, a great guy. Uh, and uh, uh, Bush 41 understood the, and I think Bush Bush 43 also understood that very well. And uh, I would say uh, President Clinton did as well. Those those people were all understood the role of the Pacific Command and and the military in general quite well, and where we fit. You know, the, where the United States military fits into the scheme of things is different than where the military in a lot of countries, including China, fits into the scheme of things. So it, it's, it's a different role. Tim, you Prime want? Minister Abe in Japan, my experience, and, and Sam may have had the pleasure of dealing with him too, remarkable man, very, hmm. uh, very cognizant of what American economic military diplomatic power represents to the area writ large and to Japan in particular. And Japan gives us $2 billion, B, billion dollars a year to keep our forces stationed in Japan. Uh, he gets it, Prime Minister Abe. Hmm. The Chinese would say his visits to Yasukuni Shrine show that he doesn't get it, <laughs> that they would have a fundamental disagreement. And I would actually support the Chinese view that it's someone who just doesn't understand history and can't get history behind him to kind of have Japan play its proper role in the future. But You know, I think the characteristics of c the civilians that I've dealt with in the most, I think, productive way in which I could do my job and they could, they could do uh, theirs uh, were not the ones who, who sort of put the armed forces up on some kind of a pedestal, thank you for your service, you guys are wonderful, you know, da, da, da. Or the ones who, who, uh, who thought that, uh, you know, we're, you know, knuckle-dragging militarists uh, and we can't trust, be trusted to, uh, you know, go to the head unsupervised by us. Uh, so, uh, and, but it's the, it, it's the, uh, the ones who understand that, uh, you know, respect the job that we have to do uh, recognize that uh, they have jobs that they have to do, and you can sort of talk about these things, and then reach, reach the uh, reach the, the right uh, solutions. And uh, that's very much personality dependent. On, on the other hand, I think, you know, we may have sort of lost a little bit with the all volunteer service, which has been so, so wonderful in terms of the quality of the armed forces in other ways, but. People just aren't familiar with uh, those who wear the uniform now so much. It's not an uncle. It's not a cousin. It's not a, it's not a, br a brother, a, si a, a sister. It's uh, just somebody uh, o over there, and you sort of evaluate them by what you read and uh, a few odd things. And, and I've, I've found the, that the, the civilian leaders who have a certain amount of military experience themselves, who, who know that you have, you know, half of all admirals graduate in the bottom half of their admiral class, and, and, uh, <laughs> that, and so half of <laughs> and, you, and and uh, you know there's strengths and weaknesses, but there's a mutual respect there. That, that, that then it work, then it works out okay. Not not when there are misconceptions about either how how either wonderful or terrible uh, the military is. Uh, a noun that I object strenuously to. I found that the most uh, valued civilian leadership were the ones who actually went to Asia and PACOM. Um, that actually took the time to get on an airplane and go places and see things, meet people, see the vast, vast distances, uh, took a look at the history of how the region was shaped and what's, what's motivating it today. Because quite frankly, I mean, it's a hard place to get to. It's a long ways, even though we're all Pacific nations, Pacific Ocean, you can take every land mass in the world and put it in the Pacific Ocean, still have room for another continent. 
That's how big it is. So it's, it's huge. So you have to get out there and you have to look around. Uh, I was always very impressed by our State Department folks. Uh, I call them the little engine that can because they're small. Uh, but they are out in that part of the world and they're cutting down big trees, you know, in regions of the world where there's just not a lot of, uh, not a lot of support for them. And so, um, so I was always pleased with them. Charles. Thank you. You just touched upon Japan and the Prime Minister Abe. Made me feel that look, uh, what Germany did to uh, the state of Israel after the Second World War to apologize openly. And I think their relationship has restored to a very, very constructive uh, manner. And to secure the Pacific even more if Japan and China could get along well. And their one thorny point is that Prime Minister Abe refused to apologize for what happened in Second World War. What can we do to encourage him to, to really take that posture to get that chapter over with? I mean, you have to look at the long term. Back in uh, 2000, Prime Minister Obuchi and President Jiang Zemin were that far from a, the sort of formal apology and acceptance of apology which uh, had been, which had, had occurred between Prime Minister Obuchi and President Kim Dae-shung somewhat before. And the Chinese torpedoed, torpedoed that one. The Korean uh, apology given and given and received compensation paid didn't didn't hold up. Uh, the comfort women came up, it, it rekindled uh, rekindled it. So it's a it's a long it's a long road. Uh, and uh, I you know I think if you stand back a little bit and look and look at the trends, uh, despite the despite the um, uh, those on both sides who sometimes for sincere reasons, sometimes for pretty pretty all political gain stoke these national national resentments uh, are having less power than the general feelings within uh, within countries when there's not a crisis going on that shows a greater amount of acceptance as the generations go on. But it's a it's a long it's a long process. I was asked once what was the thing I was most surprised about as PACOM commander. I said I was surprised by the intensity and the unpredictability of nationalism in all the countries in Asia. Right. Now, it's other places in the world, but in particular in Asia. How fast things could, nationalism is, issues, in, whether it's in Japan or Korea or China, pick a place, Philippines, how fast they can spin in that direction, nationalism, and drive their thinking in ways that are not productive to Asian unity or the bigger picture of, of cooperation and peaceful existence in, in the economic engine of the world. Bob Levinson, one very short because we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, the, um, the, the problem with China and, and, and North Korea, I'm just wondering, a number of years ago I sat at a table with a woman who was part of the a Chinese representative at the six party talks and we started to talk about the nuclear de uh, problem. She said, nothing's going to happen here. They hate us. So my question is today, is there a possibility that China will really uh, respond in a manner which could alleviate some of the tensions? I don't Everybody know. Look at, <laughs> it's the $64,000 question. Or the, yes, it's possible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, there, are, there, are, there are things that the Chinese can do that are really quite doable. They can expel uh, Korean workers. So there are 19,000 Korean workers currently in China, which generates foreign exchange for North Korea. Send them home. They can stop business. There's, you know, the Chinese announced business with North Korea went up 37% last year in 2000. You kind of go, what? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, so th there are things they can do. The question is, do they have the political will to do it? And President Trump has made this the litmus test of U.S.-China relations. So maybe we will see something that we haven't seen. But well, there are two factors. One, one factor is, uh, does China see it in its interest to yep. assert those sorts of things? And from the Chinese uh, point of view, if their assertion of pressure results in, results in a 
chaos on their border of the Yalo. Why should they do? Why should they do that? That doesn't. If they saw a clear path through to a place that was to their advantage, I think they would further do it. The second set of considerations is on the North 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 Korean end. Uh, you know, Juche, self-reliant. Uh, um, philosophy they have thrives on adversity, uh, and uh, that, 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 as, as we discussed earlier, the more the more foreign devils that you can blame for the sorts of privation that you are inflicting on your on your people, the better. And if China is going to inflict some more uh, on the North Koreans and one more in their rogues gallery, that uh, shows why they uh, you know oppressing their people and their economy isn't working. And so I think there are these two factors in terms of what. China sees in its interests and what North Korea is willing to tolerate that puts some real limits on, on, on this and uh, the, the, the judgment calls. These are not things that you can work out with an engineering equation, but uh, I, I think they are, are, make it pretty difficult to think that China could solve the problem by doing even the things that Steve but, says. But they some, China inflicts some short-term pain with oil, water, things like that that they cut off. The difference is, is they don't announce it to the world. They give North Korea a way to do it without having to lose so much face. And they, but those are things that are in China's interest yeah, that they right. want. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your for your service to our country. <laughs> Thank you for making this members' meeting so memorable.